So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 24th of, 21st of December um, 2011. And we've got some folks who still want to talk about Walk Out, Walk On, which is wonderful. And um, we, we invited Brian Ingram as well, who's somebody who's walked into uh, electoral politics, uh, being inspired by uh, the Occupy movement. Brian will tell his own story here in a bit, but let's do brief introductions. Monica, do you want to handle that for me? Um, you were doing a great job right sure. before the show started. Go ahead. Sure, why doesn't everyone just introduce themselves? How's that? <laughs> Adam, why don't you go first? There you go. Okay, my, my name's Adam Mackey. I'm um, in Fort Collins, Colorado. I work with uh, Monica at the BU House. I'm involved in the, the research there, the video documentation, um, the detox. Um, I just finished a master's program in English education at CSU, and um, I'll be an instructor of composition there, teaching um, college composition. Thanks, Adam. How about you, Brian? Well, my name's Brian Ingram. I'm a teacher in Fort Texas. Can I be heard? Yes. Uh, am mm -hmm. I hearing me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, we're hearing you fine. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Everybody I'm does that the first elementary time. school okay. teacher. I'm sorry? I said everybody asks that the first time around, so it's okay. <laughs> this is my first, so thank okay. you. Um, as I was saying, I was, I'm an elementary school teacher. I teach fourth grade and fifth grade science. Um, I've been in teaching for nine years, and uh, teaching is my second career. Uh, before entering teaching, I was a child protective services social worker. So I've been working with kids pretty much for the last 20 years. Cool. Thanks, Chad. Hey, uh, I'm Chad Sansing. I teach humanities uh, in this year, civics in particular, at a uh, Virginia charter school, middle school, for non-traditional learners. And uh, as Monica said earlier, I putter around a cooperative catalyst online and try to help people find places where they feel comfortable talk, describing the problems they see in education and proposing solutions to. Thanks. And Jackie, are you really here? <laughs> yes. <it's> Hello. You. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? We can hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> Just waving. Can you talk? Hello? Jackie. I'm lurking. Oh, okay. There I'm we go. I'm lurking tonight in the dark. I'm lurking. Okay. <laughs> Jackie the Lurker. You can find her just about anywhere online if you'd like to know more. We won't reveal her. Marianne? Thanks, Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Marianne. I'm from New Jersey. Um, I am a progressive educator and an artist. Ah. <laughs> so simple. I like that. <laughs> good. good. Pam. Good. And I'm Pam Moran, and I am from Central Virginia. And Chad and I work together in Albemarle County. And um, I try to work to support educators to do great things with children. Cool. Paul, how about you? Oh, I'm Paul Allison, and I just finished the the place part of Walk Out, Walk On, um, the one in South Africa, and I was so <laughs> touched by how you know I work in the Bronx. And the Bronx is an amazing place, too, in terms of history and possibility and damage and all of that. So I really resonated a lot with that. So I, I work at a, a school called the uh, Bronx Academy <clears throat> Senior High. It's a school for kids who are transfer students. And it's a school that is being closed down. So I get a lot of freedom. <laughs> so there you go. What's going to happen to your gardens, Paul? I, you know, those were out in Queens. I'm going to try to start some gardens in the Bronx and hooking up with some community mm -hmm. gardens. But that, you know, following that. yeah, and I love how gardens show up almost in every chapter in Walk Out, Walk On, too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. gardens seem really important. Um, yeah. Monica, do you want to introduce yourself? <clears throat> and then we'll go. Sure. Um, I'm in Loveland, so I'm about 
20 miles away from Adam, and um, been working the last four years with kids, um, outsourcing their ideas to redefine education. So it's been pretty exhilarating. Um, cool. So. Um, what be Kathy Davidson's um, latest comment on um, her book, Now You See It, in reference to your gardens, um, she says the answers that she gives to most often are garden and relax. And garden because um, we need to have our hands in dirty and, and doing it, doing things, and relax. Um, <coughs> which I think is a great mindset to have. That, um, and, and I think it's, it's, it shows up a lot in the book as well, that you know, look at what you have and use what you have. And it does create a calm, because I think most often we don't get things done because we're too busy. You know? So anyway, that, when you said that about the garden, I just had to throw that out there. So. Cool. Paul, why don't you take over here? Yeah, I since Brian is new to us, I thought maybe Brian could tell his story a little bit. Um, so let me just throw it to you, Brian. Um, what's been going on with you? <laughs> Are you really running for Congress? <laughs> um, yes, actually I am. I have uh, filed a declaration of intent with my sec state Secretary of State. Um, it was a simple process, and that's about where the simpleness ends. Um, in Texas, we were having a redistricting battle fight that was about to make it to the Supreme Court, but they um, decided to go ahead and settle, I believe, and now because of the infighting that was going on between the two <laughs> parties, um, the primaries were pushed up a month, pushed back a month from March 6th to April 3rd. So my time in gathering the 500 signatures I need for the for my petition was cut out by 30 days so uh, pressure is going to be mounting it is not set up for people who just want to run for office you have to be affiliated for some reason with a political party um, and one of the reasons why I'm running is because it's been both parties that have pretty much sold us out that's mm -hmm. that's how I stand how I'm standing on it um, I've started web page creation and uh, my cousin-in-law has his own server and is going to host it for free which is going to save him about a hundred bucks a year um, and the website is www.brianingram.org and be kind if you go there for the first time because it's my first time um, anything specific more you might want uh, sure and Feel free to jump in. I don't know if you had had a chance to look at Walk Out, Walk On yet. I think maybe you have a I little have bit. Got, I've gotten up to the South Africa chapter. Oh, I love the, uh, in the same place. Zapatistas and uh, the one after that I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, Brazil, yes. Uh, I love the concept of upcycling. And I'm, in my science classes, I try and push that as much as I can instead of throwing something away. How can we, what we call is reusing, but to make it something that it wasn't intended for, I think is <clears throat> an even um, a more fundamental concept that needs to be stressed. Say a little more about um, your inspiration. Your, how did you, as a school teacher, decide to run for Congress? Well, when you look at what we're supposed to be teaching, I'm, I'm not sure how other standards are are pushed in y'all states, but here in Texas we have the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills and our standardized test is what is tests over those knowledge and skills. And they're not tested in social studies till the eighth grade, but I still have to teach those um, essentials. And some of the things that, that I need to teach re are regarding our Bill of Rights, our a history of, of the abuses that, that have occurred in our, in our country's history and um, basically some of the principles and concepts that sets us apart from other countries. I try and weave that in as much as I can where our government's concerned. But after watching what was going on, how can I say that we have a freedom of expression or a freedom of speech or a right to um, petition our government for grievances 
whenever a group of kids at UC Davis are sitting there down on the ground, not posing a threat to anybody, and somebody is macing them in the face with something that's supposed to be a non-lethal means of control rather than something that, a shortcut for crowd control. I, I, I have the cognitive dissonance finally broke through um, on that, and I decided to do something to take a stand. Uh, and running for the U.S. House was the first thing I thought of. Mm-hmm. If for nothing else, than just to change the, the, the dialogue that's going on. So just so everybody is clear on this, I... You know, we don't have this totally planned or scripted at all. So um, please uh, please feel free to jump in and ask Brian questions and Brian back and forth. Let's just see where we want to go with this, if that sounds fair. Um, anybody want to propose any themes for tonight? <laughs> Having met Brian and wherever you are in the book what you've been thinking well, about how, go ahead how about if Brian. i put something out there um thanks yep. what do y'all think about what's been going on regarding what's happening in congress it does affect us directly hmm. I mean, in wisconsin they want to take away collective bargaining rights for teachers they effectively did it and the governor is looking to be recalled there are 500 there are 500,000 signatures they need 40,000 more and they still have a month to go there is a wave going on that is changing there's an attitude shift going on in this country well and, and i think that that actually marianne and i were kind of involved in a conversation on twitter earlier this evening and it started with just my frustration with seeing what's happening with children um the homeless in particular it was a real topic of, of intense angst for teachers right before the holidays because they knew that they were sending, in some cases, children out into the cold without food, without, in some cases, potentially a, a place that they could even call shelter. And, and so we were, were really focusing on just the lack of universal support for families in this country that's been just exacerbated by the, uh, the economic piece, but it's been something that's been endemic forever um, in, in terms of uh, that sense of care and consciousness of talking about the right, of having the right conversations about things that really matter. And I think that that's one of the things that's really missing from our, from our political, and, and somebody kicked in and said it's even part of the, sort of the, some of the missing links with, with uh, faith-based uh, leadership you know, in this country is just a sense of what's really worth talking about. And what do you do? And, and Marianne, you kind of kicked out some uh, some thoughts about what can we do. Hmm. You mean tonight, Pam? Yeah. 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 I, I got as far as asking, what can we do? <laughs> um, I think um, Ira gave a lot of. Um, this was. I'm sorry, everybody. This was a. Twitter exchange we were having, just so you, you know what was happening. But um, I thought that Ira's list, and I'm going to try and pull it up on my computer so I can uh, reference it, um, listed some really important dynamics. Um, let me let me see if I can pull it up, and um, and then I'll put it in. Does everyone have the group chat on the side going? I'm watching it right now. Yeah. So I'll put it. I'm going to. Take a, I don't know if I can put a screenshot there or not, but I'm going to try. <coughs> the, the thing is, the people who are, which, if you're at edtechtalk.com slash live, that would be the place to put it, by the way. Edtech. Ed, edtechtalk.com slash live. Mm-hmm. Because there are people watching there, not too many, okay. frankly, but... Um, but put it wherever you'd like and we can figure that out. Okay. Chad, do you have any thoughts that you want to jump in with? Yeah, I've I just been thinking about um, you know, what I think walk out, walk on, mm-hmm. kind of you know, gets right, for lack of a better term, and certainly what um, the communities described in that book do well is 
bring people together locally who are willing to just to act and to do something different and to say you know here's the local situation here are the local things we can do to address it and and finding workarounds whether it's swaraj or swaraj or jugad or zapatismo or whatever you want to call it i think here we would call it more things like hacking and making you know and, and i see a lot of commonality between what i read in walk out walk on and the, the hacking and making community even though that seems more like kind of a, a nerdy recreational thing there was more of a, an ethic of hacking and making even with regards to the rules and schools we could be having more of those kind of conversations those local community-based conversations about what do our kids need and then how do we align what we have here here being in each of our communities to address the problems that we have in each of our communities and a lot of policy and curriculum and you know instruction and supervision I think directly opposes that work certainly prevents it and makes time an artificially scarce commodity to use on behalf of what local needs for education for caring for children are so can I one of the one of the themes that I want to discuss at some point and that keeps coming up for me as I'm reading the book is how um, things feel very familiar to me. Like the circles in Zimbabwe um, feel very familiar to some advisory or family group circles that I've done. Um, I've done sort of project adventure kinds of things that feel familiar to some of the stuff in Mexico and, you know, the I can give example after example. Oh, and then the example you just gave of the make community and the upcycling um, seems similar, yet there seems like a different quality to what's happening in that work as well. And Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. exactly. Go ahead. So I was just going to say, for, for me, like, you know, if I, if I read Make Magazine or whatever, I'm doing that recreationally. Whereas if I'm trying to approach something in my classroom and figure out a workaround to something, that's much more, uh, I don't know, that just seems more <clears throat> urgent, more needed, more more relevant to, to certainly what, what's going on in, in the education for my students. And like how do you, how do you decommodify or how do you take that hacker ethic, uh, making ethic, and take it out of kind of um, boutique places or, you know, ostensibly or what might be referred to or viewed by government agencies in certain cases as you know, criminal places, how do you get that ethic into schools? Um, because whether you're hacking or making, you're willing to take something apart or to take some things that have been taken apart and to do something new with them. And I think that's very desperately what we need, but I don't know how to, mm, how, how do you transfer the parts of that culture to schools were with urgency rather than with you know this is something this is another extra we're going to have a hacking or making an elective that's not the point the well, point what is I, what, I think, the schedule. what I think with that chat is um, you know and this it, is it, Adam ethos. Mackey go ahead yeah do you want me to introduce myself I'm no. Adam Mackey Good um, <laughs> ethos you know I, I remember reading in one of my classes um, about, you know, new ethos stuff, you know, in terms of, you know, the new literacies and things, you know, that are happening outside of school, you know, being recognized as, you know, um, <clears throat> like what you're talking about, the, the hacking and the making. I mean, that's all learning, you know. Um, I haven't read the, the Wheatley book. I, I will. I looked at the article Monica sent me, and, you know, I think I, I don't know if you got that, Paul, the stuff that I, you know, suggested about systems, you know, and that's something I'm interested in is, you know, Go ahead. you know, it yeah. sounds like Brian is, um, you know, running for Congress to try to, you know, do make a change within within the system that now exists, you know, and, um, and bringing in some of these learnings into school and, you know, to try to make them, quote, credible or, you know, ethical or, you know, the ethos is really what strikes me, you know, and, and, and I have a lot of questions around that, you know, to me, learning is learning, you know, whether it's, you know, acknowledged by the current system or not. Um, 
So I think that's a little bit of what, what we're up against with some of what Chad was talking about in terms of, you know, the making and the hacking. I mean, there, there should be spaces, I think, in schools for students to explore that. And I think that's what we're trying to, to do at the, you know, the BU house, largely, is to provide space for people to explore those possibilities. A, a problem that I've been seeing, just something that's been just stuck in my craw for the last, you know, nine years since I've been a teacher, um, is this commoditization that comes with how a curriculum is supposed to be. The kids are supposed to know how to read, they're supposed to know how to do arithmetic, they're supposed to now, through science, think critically. Um, and the, the, the problems come in with that. For example, a few years ago I had a child who had dyslexia. She could not pass a standardized test to save her life. She uh, she failed the three attempts at uh, her reading test, and by by state law, she was not supposed to move down to sixth grade. We all went to a committee. She went to summer school. Went to a committee. She showed enough progress, so she went ahead and went on the, to sixth grade. But at the end of the school year, though, what broke my heart about all this was she gave me a beautiful wood burning art decoration thing that involved you know I had a, I had a dog that died and over the school year and she did a, a, a beautiful wood burning into this beautiful piece of, of, of oak um, she asked I, mean, I don't know why she asked but she asked to borrow a picture of my dog one time and it came back I wish I had it in my classroom though um, and after putting like four coats of varnish it looks like she she buffed it with triple quadruple odd steel wool um, there's no test for that and she's gonna make more as an artist than I will as a teacher and to me, that's where, where these standardized tests are missing, is the other um, learning that's going on that just cannot be tested. And I don't know how to define that or what word to put it under, but if, it's any, if there's ever a failing, um, she's a child that would be left behind because of these standardized testing. And She'll drop out because she won't be passing. There was a, a fantastic... I mean, like, fantastic, as in, like, really moving and, and provocative comment on the co-op today about, you know, a school in New Mexico uh, where the kids go home and are kept inside so they're not out in the violence of the community around them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that's a chapter I'm on. <laughs> that's part where they're like, how do, I, you know, how, how do you want to measure that? You know, how are, is there a test for that? Um, but the, the other piece um, that I don't want to lose that I don't know if I was uh, – clear enough about and what I was saying is, you know, if, if you go to the communities and walk out, walk on, and you ask the people doing this work what they think of government or what they think of the rules or what they think of the law, I think that you would get a very different uh, answer, very different opinions, very different relationship to those things than the relationship that exists between people who work in schools and the policies. And Part of what I'm really interested in is how do you get the people who work in schools to adopt hacker ethics with the policies and systems of schools as they are. You know, part of it is the policy. Part of it is standing up and running for office and changing the system uh, and creating kind of official sanctioned space for the right things to happen at the right times. And then part of it, I think, is you know how how at the grassroots level, at the day-to-day -day level at the work with kids level, which is supremely important. I don't know. I, I can't find exactly the right term for it, but how do, you, how do we at least start a conversation there amongst uh, the peers and colleagues in, in these systems at that face to face with student level about, you know, what can we, what are we willing to change now? What are we willing to do? That, that's a tough question and tough conversation to start, but a necessary one, I think to get to a place where people inside the system are thinking and working like some of the communities and walk out, walk on. Monica. If you, have, if you haven't seen it um, on the Berkana, um Institute page and also on Deborah Fries's, um web page, and I threw it in the group chat here on the Hangout, um, Deborah does a two-loop theory, um, just a <clears throat> short video of the two-loop theory. Um, and when I saw it, it resonated extremely with um, what we've done 
um, a connected adjacency. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, all these buzzwords. Um, yeah. Can you say? Can you say what yeah, the two yeah, loop theory I, is? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm, I'm heading there. The connected okay. adjacency is when you're um, you're outside of the system. It's kind of the idea of start anywhere and take it everywhere. Um, so you're starting right where you're at. You're, you're talking to people who you meet up with every day and having the conversations of what matters most to you. Um, but she has a really great way to explain. Um, so that's the outside of the system. And you just have the confidence, like if any of you have read um, Gordon McKenzie's uh, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, or um, Roger Martin's um, The Design of Business. It's that, that confidence and that boldness to dream big. Um, so those are, those are the people that are, and, and it's not just people, it's part of each person looking outside the system. Um, but then it, it, you know, the two, that, that loop's coming up underneath, and the, the corporate loop, the um, political loop, is on the top, and as it's dying out because of this mass now coming up, um, the bottom part is either um, just sustaining it or maybe working as like a um, hospice because we know that the, the corporate piece is dying, and so we're there for support. Um, but anyway, I highly recommend to watch that two loop theory um, by Deborah Fries and the idea of a connected adjacency, which both of those, to me, say they start anywhere and take it everywhere. Mm. I think that, Monica, the last thing you've just said, I was thinking about what Chad, the question Chad posed. Um, you know, I think there's real brilliance in start um, anywhere and follow it everywhere. Um, because I think when, you know, so often we try to leverage a system that is so big that we can't, we don't have enough power um, to, to do that. And so, um, you know, what I'm personally taking away from all of, the, of what I've been reading and, and our interactions is for me to take right action as I see it um, and, and then to, to follow what I'm doing and, and where that leads me, um, you know, deeply to not get distracted with, you know, any, any number of things I might get distracted with. And it just strikes me that, you know, revolutions might um, in these days might occur more that way than, um, than, than the power of, you know, trying to find some solution that, you know, th that isn't really there, um, as opposed to looking at, like, even like this kind of community group that we're in right now, um, you know, I don't know that we know how many people, um, you know, we actually connect with when we do this, and how many people look at this tape at another time and pick up the book and start to read it in their communities or find some other kind of interest. And it just strikes me that that horizontal scaling across a rhizome, whatever we want to call it, I think it's potentially incredibly powerful. And it's hard to put that down from a place of power. And, I, and that's what it kind of excites me that that could be um, very promising as um, a method, of, you know, to sort of speak, um, um, not against the status quo, but, but, no, I guess, yeah, I guess it is against the status quo to, to, to be able to speak. Well, I, I agree with, uh, I agree with Mary Ann, um, and, you know, what really comes to my mind is, you know, um, you know, I've been listening to, um, it's called The Giants of Philosophy, and it talks about Aristotle. And, um, you know, really for me, learning is about a virtue ethic, you know, and that's really why I've aspired to be uh, a lifelong learner, you know, and I'm, I, I don't think I was very eloquent in talking about the new ethos stuff, but, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's hard to bring, I think, in what Chad was saying, too, it's hard to bring in some of these, even with the connected adjacency, it's hard to bring in some of these things into the existing system because they do go against, they do go against, the traditional mode of, of thinking, and in some ways, that's why that's why it's innovative. That's why, to me, it's exciting. And you know, with that that wood wood burning um, example, that 
um, Brian mentioned, that that's a beautiful story and an example that the gift is in the learning. It's not something that can be tested and can never be tested. The gift itself is the experience you shared with that student and the fact that she gave you this gift is, is huge. The relationship piece, I think, is really important. I might be getting us away from where we want to go with this, but I think even with Walk Out and Walk On, um, the that are formed in those communities is, is the gift of the learning as well. Well, and you've also touched on, um, you know, I guess they're, they're trying to look at productivity. They, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of follow my politics with George Carlin. Um, if you've ever followed any of his stuff, he is uh, <laughs> as about as cynical as they get, and if you, if you take some of his, his old stuff, if you YouTube any of it, um, especially his, his rant about how the, the big club wants everybody to be obedient workers, they want people smart enough to fill out the paperwork to work, run the machinery and, and, and keep electing the people that are, are, are doing what they've, they've always done, but, but dumb enough to ignore the fact that there's a system that they're supporting that sold them out 30 years ago. And um, we're not we're not pushing creativity. What's the first thing that gets that gets cuts in the in the funding? It's not sports. It's arts. It's sciences. It's math. What we need is a Cold War type push for the math and sciences again to to get our manufacturing base up. What scares me the most is that our manufacturing base, our manufacturing manufacturing capacity, is at its lowest levels since 1941. And what happened on that year? I mean, if we ever, I mean, if they, if they want to talk about going to war or something, what are we going to do? Order our tanks from China? We, we don't make anything anymore. And it, it seems like if, <coughs> if we're going to be training any kids for a type of industry, it looks like finance is where it's going to be, is where it's going to have to go because finance now has overtaken health care as far as um, the money making product of our GDP. And that worries me, because bubbles happen in financing, not in marketing. I'm sorry, not in manufacturing. And I'm, I don't know if I'm getting off topic or not, but it's it it just seems like that where the testing is concerned, where where the draw the the need for vouchers and privatization of our schools are concerned, it's all about how can we make teachers, students, everybody else more productive. And, uh, and, and the productivity is what they're trying to measure through those tests. Well, when you I don't said know if making sense or not? Yeah, I, I think you are. I when you said we don't make anything, I immediately thought back to how we were talking about um, the upcycling and the make movement. And right before we came on the recording here, we were talking about gardening, and I just wonder, like. Mm -hmm. What do these little efforts, um, Chad, you called them boutique efforts, maybe. What do these little efforts have to do with the, the bigger picture, and does it matter? Or well, I yeah. think there's like two, there are two things, right? There, there could be like urban schools that are teaching kids rooftop gardening. I don't think that's a boutique effort. I think that's a great way to stand up and, and use that time. But it's but not. It, when I, but it I wouldn't go, feed. It wouldn't really feed the people who are even participating in that stuff, though, on some level. But go ahead. If I could argue, no, I, I would say you're probably right. I still think that you know, for a school to give time to that and and that kind of learning and to follow up with it is, is even more than what's happening at, at many schools, um, yeah. you know, that, that I went to or that I've seen. Um, but my, my boutique comments were like, you know, if I pick up a Make magazine or if I decide to do a Maker project in my house, that's different, I think, than, you know, BC Machinas providing, you know, things for a town that, that wouldn't use those things without, without power. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I don't know if I'm making sense, but I, but I feel a big <coughs> gap between that stuff and the stuff Brian's talking about, and I'm maybe I should just relax and let the gap be there. But 
Yeah, uh, you mean you know, between the, the people who figure out what to make next, or who get really interested in making things, are gonna, you know, they're gonna start with something. Um, and it's important to probably to have more and more opportunities for making and creating and doing and hacking in schools. But like, even if they're if they're small, if they can grow, if they can grow out laterally, if communities have the space and are allowed to align their resources the way that, that they think they should to teach some of these things, you know, we're going to get more people interested in making things and think about how to make them in new ways, and, and that can really drive innovation. And part of the efficiency, you can have real efficiency in taking a test, you can have real efficiency in working in a factory, but the idea of becoming efficient at doing the same thing again and again and again is kind of stifling at some point to figuring out what's next. So all these little efforts that have, you know, potential uh, that are different and that, you know, find out what the kids are interested in and, and go from there, I think are going to yield better results further down the line in terms of innovation and you know, job creation and uh, the next thing that's going to carry the country through. Part of the shift, though, needs to be, I think, in our mindset. And that's what I got out of that article written by Wheatley, you know, and some of the... Some of the thinking that I've done is that the product, you know, the making is really in the process, you know, the process of learning, the process of forming relationships with other people, the process of what, you know, happens when, you know, people get in the same room together or in a, you know, a Google Hangout together. I mean, if we're still trying to, to measure ourselves by, you know, a 1940s productivity, I don't think that's really going to sustain us at all, you know, moving forward in the 21st century because, you know, the product is really, it's a different kind of product. It's changing. I think the products that are um, selling are changing. Look at Facebook. Facebook is a, is a huge product. And, and what, is, what is it made up of? It's made up of people, you know? And so in the way that the world's connected today, I think we need to, you know, reevaluate the way that we think about interactions and exchanges. One of the things that, that's on my mind Pam, these days yeah. is how you how you create opportunities for the work that whether it's what Chad's talking about or Brian or or really any of the folks that are in the, the room together right now. How do you how do you create situations that allow that work to go viral? And one of the things that I really loved, and I, I can't remember which chapter it was in, but there was a, a I think somewhere in, in Walk Out, Walk On, that uh, there was an allusion to the idea that we own that which we create. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we've really taken the creative process away from so much of America mm -hmm. that at some level it's really difficult to almost get that flywheel moving again, whether it's inside uh, classrooms, inside schools, inside communities. Um, I was really taken that one of the themes all the way through this has been where the, uh, they, the, the women kind of end at the end of the book with the idea that, they're, that the concept of hero as leader is not going to, to really be able to drive that sense of viral shift or change. And so that's one of the things I'm kind of interested in is how do you, how do you socially map what causes things to start to go viral and then is it possible to create more environments where that happens? Mm -hmm. The point I was trying to make about product, about the manufacturing productivity and all, um, is that people need an income and the, you know, not so much that we need to start opening up more manufacturing centers and um, create more cars and stuff. Um, it's the imbalances that we're seeing where there's, I, I think the root of it is there's this drive to have these investors demand a 20 to 30 percent return on their investments. Therefore, what's the easiest way to lower your costs? And that's to throw your workers overboard and move your factories overseas. Um, I've, I've got a 15 year old stepdaughter, and uh, she has no problem shelling out $100 for a pair of jeans that she's earned somewhere. Um, 
and she's not the only person that does that. If she's going to shell out $100 for a pair of jeans, that kind of tells me that um, there's, there's a sense out there that it's not cost that's causing people to demand stuff be made overseas. It's, I think it's more the, the return on investment that, that is causing everybody to demand labor costs go down. Um, if I'm trying to put this into words, and I, get, I sound so convoluted. Um, it seems that the, part of the talking points that I've been noticing in some of the political blogs is that if you want to pay the uh, lettuce pickers, the tomato pickers, a fair, decent minimum wage, a living wage, be prepared to spend ten dollars on a head of lettuce. I, I think that's bogus. I don't believe that at all. Um, I. The problem is we don't we don't know the real cost of what it would, of of how much it would cost for the end product if we were to pay everybody a fair decent wage rather than exploiting migrant workers or um, having ten year olds put our shoes together in Malaysia. It's the the data just doesn't seem to be out there. Um, I try to buy American whenever I can because I think we need to keep our jobs in this country and. It's getting harder and harder to find, as you as you well know. Um, I'm old enough to remember whenever, if anybody said that they were going to get you 20% return on your investments, you could look at them and think that they were going to they're trying to defraud you. But now that seems to be this uh, the bellwether. If you're not, if if a company is not putting out 20% or more on their for their shareholders, then the CEO is not doing his or her job. And they need to be fired. We need to come back to a time when 12 to 15 percent was a comfortable return on investments. Brian, and to me, can, that's what's. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, can you walk us? I don't know if this what the language is here, but walk us back from like. Do you want to see changes in your school and your the education of your the young people in your school? And how does that connect with these bigger issues that you're asking about? Is that a fair question? Do you know? What changes I want to see in my community, school, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, don't throw anything. As I said, I'm from Texas, and this is where the standardized testing stuff came from when Governor Bush was, hmm. was governor. Um, at the time, Rick Perry was lieutenant governor, and we referred to Bush as the smart one. Um, he uh, he started pushing this whole tax test, standardized testing thing. And I remember reading, I wish I could find the source, but at the time, before he became uh, president, I remember reading at the time that if you were to calculate all of the money spent on anything that the standardized test touches. I'm talking about printing the tests, grading the tests, transporting the tests, securing the tests, training the teachers of the test, providing teaching materials regarding the test, 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 anything this test touched. It comes to a million dollars per question that our state is spending. That is a chunk of change. And there's grades three through 11, Reading, math, social studies, science, <clears throat> writing. So I don't, know, I don't know how many tests I listed off are there, about five. And they're averaging 40 to 60 questions per test. That is a lot of money. And that budget, for some reason, is not negotiable. That budget does not change from year to year. What and does change are the budgets for the schools. We lost $6 billion this, this past fiscal year. Um, and... Luckily, nobody was laid off in my school district, but next year, it's going to happen if, mm -hmm. if things don't change. Um, you're talking about a mountain of change that I'd like to see happen. The first thing that I'd love to see get rid of is uh, to stop stressing on this test. Mm -hmm. um, I wish our, our state was in the same position start, as Steve. Utah. And, I'm sorry. I just agree with you. I, um, what can we do in the meantime, though? <laughs> I mean... Your story of helping that young woman uh, in spite of the test is one good story. I'm just wondering if there are ways to think about what we can do now. 
that's what my head is swimming on it all. I mean, mm -hmm. that's maybe others I, have. I don't thoughts know if to, I'm yeah. sorry. Maybe others have thoughts about that. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, if, thanks. If you go back and think about the corporatization and industrialization of of education and, and of testing. You know, on the on the one hand, you've got a kind of educating for not just efficiency, but for a return on investment. We get, you know, if we purchase this material from this vendor, because uh, we have to get to this score, you know, we got to get to this score, no matter how many percentage points it is away. And, and that's a that's a way to look at things: learning for results, learning for achievement. And if you go back to walk out, walk on, and you think more about sustainability, what does learning look like that begets more learning, rather than learning that begets results or learning that begets achievement or profit? And that's that's the kind of translocal conversation I'd love to see um, bubble up uh, with great frequency throughout our country. What does learning that begets learning look like, and how do we run our schools, or how do we run our communities as schools, or how do we open up learning spaces that we don't so neatly define as schools to to go after that vision, and why? Why settle for a government, or why settle for policies that prevent you from having those conversations? Which Amen. everybody, even the politicians, rhetorically, will tell you, you know, oh yeah, we want lifelong learning. We want kids to learn forever. Um, that that's where it is for me. So like, and, and I, I, this is my first year being like a full time um, social studies civics teacher. So I've not I've not had a whole day to think about content delivery before like I've had this year mm -hmm. and so I, I'm relearning all kinds of old lessons and finding all kinds of old tensions coming back in new ways so I don't know but I know that I like to think about it and I like to talk about it with my kids and to figure out um, and to, to negotiate things on a daily basis and when things are like you know what can we do when a kid has an idea about what they want to do with class time it's just an absolute home run for that kid and it fits and they're gonna learn something it's gonna be amazing um, don't bother scaling the wall to try to catch it. Let them hit the ball out of the park. That's what I love science. Love about science so much. Um, they, I, I do what I can to tap that child's curiosity, and they want to know how or why something works, and we explore as much as we can out of why something works. Um, we we have to get the background knowledge behind it, and then they come to their own conclusions based on whatever theories or facts that they've come across in their learning. <laughs> With math, however, that's kind of hard <laughs> because they don't... You know, math for them is just something that they got to take a test on. Yeah. And I try to explain to them that... That's a, that's a, that's a function of socialization. You know? That's another <laughs> thing we can address through such conversations. It, yeah. There's all kinds of ways to be motivated to learn math, and some of them are, you know, pretty desperate and much more real than we present in schools. But kids deal with them every day. True. You know, if you put a, if you start trying to map social interactions or um, things that are happening to with frequency in their families and looking at things that way, uh, there's a lot of way that math becomes very personal and real for great reasons and, and reasons that we wish people didn't have to, to learn about. But um, it. Finding those things comes from comes from conversations, and it doesn't come from conversations about what resource to adopt, or you know, what program are we going to use. I'm sure. Or website. Where are we? Where are the kids? <laughs> what community is it? And, and then all that stuff might trickle in as, as ways to help with what's really important. But I think it's you know, Paul, I just go back to you know, what, what could we all do tomorrow. We could all open negotiations with our students about what they want to learn about in their classrooms. Maybe so, not tomorrow, winter, with winter break and all, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you, Chad. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I got a couple of parents on Twitter I could reach out to. So, I don't know, am, I, am, I, am I meeting your agenda for the meeting today? I don't know what, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it, sure. it's a bureaucracy where I'm working, so. <laughs> Is there a agenda? Yeah. Uh, no, we're like, we're like lateral. Okay. Well, 
Okay, so I have a proposal for coming back to the book a little bit, and and, and I'm going to say what's on my mind about it again. Um, I'm totally fascinated as I'm reading the book. There are moments in the book, if I could bring up an irritation I have, which is that some of the things they're talking about are totally familiar to me. The um, the scaling across is what we do in the National Writing Project. Um, you know, there are, and 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 the, there's a certain um, unfamiliarity that they assume that we have with some of the processes that they're um, talking about that I'm not unfamiliar with at all. And so that irritates me a little bit when that happens in the book. Um, but having said that, and this is what I wanted to ask you to think about maybe saying, it's like, what's, what themes are you noticing? And I'll say it again. What I'm noticing is the gap between the make movement that I'm more familiar with, for example, and upcycling. There's a social commitment to the communities that they're describing that I'm not as connected with as I'd like to be. Um, and again, I could give example after example of that as I'm coming across in the book. Um, but that's what's that's the sort of theme I'm following as I'm reading the book. So I just wanted to ask you what kinds of themes are coming up for you um, in Walk Out, Walk On as you're reading it. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll go right with you there, Paul. I, I I don't know. I really kind of enjoyed. Oh. Reading about the things and a little bit of kind of feeling affirmed for recognizing some of them, hmm. but I'll, I'll just sum my things up. I'll just ask a question: like, here's my theme coming out of the book. Who will be our Zapatistas? Say it again. Our what? Who will be our Zapatistas? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm wondering if it's somewhere in the Occupy movement, but that's just a, a question as well. But yeah. I was wandering there too. <laughs> Others? Other thoughts Monica about the book like in general? If you don't like the way I framed it, go for it. <laughs> um, just a lot of stuff. I think Good. we've had our parents. I think, you know, um, we've, we've asked what can we do specifically. I think getting parents in groups where we have maybe World Cafe type conversations where we're asking what is your most important question what what is it in your gut that you really want for your for your kids and those that's the bottom loop um, that Deborah talks about those are the those are the gut level things that don't fit into the system you know and and supporting that and then um, at the end of the book Manish Jane um, talks about people wanting to sell some of those upcycles in the United States and how great that would be because now we can bring more funds back um, to India. And he says that completely defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. And so on the other hand, now from the system down, we have so many conversations about defense. We have so many conversations about how the consumerism is going to work, mm -hmm. how um, budget's going to work. And I think um, as the lower end, as the ones who are trying to make this come through, we need to, I think Marianne referenced it, some things we just need to ignore. I mean, we can acknowledge, we can gracefully acknowledge, but we can't let that be a distraction to us um, because we've seen in history, we've seen ourselves spin our wheels with those conversations. So that's what I'm thinking about. Just picking you arbitrarily. Marianne, any thoughts? Um, I guess what um, what comes to mind really is just singular, is that making connections with all of you is a function of walking out and walking on. And um, I'm really interested in small actions that um, might scale across. And uh, and and now I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna spend the next. I don't know how long. <laughs> I want to say a week, but it's probably gonna be like a year. Thinking about Pam's question because I haven't left it uh, yet. Um, uh, because I have absolutely no idea how you would know 
this uh, where is sort of um, like the perturbations of a complex system, where does it occur that something goes viral? Um, and yeah, so that right now, that's what I've spent time thinking about. Um, uh, but I trust that among this group and others, um, there there will be some response to that. But I think that's an incredibly interesting question, and so that's where I am. That's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Brian, it hopped to you. I don't know why, but any last thoughts as we're kind of coming to an end here? Thank you for coming on. By the way, appreciate it. <laughs> no, not a problem. I'm, I'm... This, the, the learning curve has been incredible for me. I've started reading the book. I uh, had to purchase a webcam and design a web page, so it's been busy for me. Um, all the while taking care of a seven-year-old. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? About Just any last thoughts as we're about signing the book off. Or, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's taken a lot to absorb. I've had to go back to reread some stuff. To, mm -hmm. to let it filter through. Um, I, I love the story about the Zapatistas and the upcycling that they used. I, I immediately want to go out and, and make a bicycle powered water pump. Uh, we have a ravine that, that drains the, all the, the water out from under from, from our streets and our neighborhood and I immediately thought of a 20 to 40 foot PVC pipe and taking an old bicycle and just having free water from that drainage that just sits there and stagnates. Um, the leach from the from the other stuff would be great fertilizer for my garden. Um, uh, we've got a garden in our backyard and uh, went and bought a pressure canner from Amazon.com and we can our own vegetables when we can. So mm. it's it, it I love digging in the dirt and I took I brought that to my classroom. Uh, we bought some brought, bought some produce from a local market, and using tomato seeds, cantaloupe seeds, zucchini seeds that we harvested just from the fruits and and such, the kids were amazed that those seeds were alive and they started growing from something they first cut open themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't, they they thought the seeds only came in a package, and it's that kind of stuff that I'm I brought to the classroom, and I, I just if. I'm not having delusions of grandeur about my about this campaign that I'm going to be running. If for nothing else, I want to just check the conversation. Yeah. At least we're no longer talking about birth certificates, you know. <laughs> so. No. I mean, everything you just described there, I do want to ask. Like, and I don't, I don't mean to leave the question here, but isn't that enough change? All that you know, learning seeds and so forth. But it's not, because we're totally inspired by your hacking the political system here as well. So... Hacking has such a negative connotation. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. That's why you I know. said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, we gotta do the teachers oh, teaching yeah. teachers hack jam. Look at that. There you go. Yeah. I bet it's the NSA is probably listening in right now. <laughs> Pam, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, I think that, that one of the things that's really on my mind is mm. that we do have to figure out how to get the flywheel spinning. And I do believe that there's something that's kind of an awakening that's occurring across the country right now. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, I wonder is how within the context of sort of renorming who we are socially, who we are culturally, what it is that, that's going to be the trigger because I think there's going to be a flip here and the question is how do we make sure that we do everything we can to help that flip hit a critical mass mm. and that's what I really keep coming back to is mm. what are some of the levers that we use as collaborators and co-creators of that work that helps us move it to a point where we can say Hey, watch and look and see the world change as a result of the work we're doing. And it is happening. But it's not it hasn't hit that 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 energy level yet that really gets that flywheel spinning. Yeah. So I'd stop there. I, and I think you're right that that there's a, a wave going on. I mean, for the first time in my life, there's a there's a movement for change and it only comes around once in a generation. 
And for the kids that are out there right now, um, I don't know. I've been thinking about how to introduce this into my classroom without making it look like I'm indoctrinating them or something. But there is a change that's going on. And if we're not at the top, at the crest of that wave to, to, to flow along with it, we're going to get crushed by it or we're going to, get, we're going to pass it by. And I don't think it's going to come around in our lifetimes again. Well, um, Jim, um, sorry. You know, Brian, I, I created a, um, I had to create a mock regents exam, our standardized test. And I created it, I created it all with poetry and stories and essays from the Occupy movement. So I've created an, uh -huh. <laughs> an Occupy the Regents exam, um, which I'll That's put out great. soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'll fly with the state, but we'll see. Um, Adam, can, can we give you last word? <laughs> and then we should sign up. Sure. I mean, the two things that are in my mind now, um, you know, and something that Marianne brought up, you know, about how things go viral and how these changes happen. Um, you know, I just had a conversation with my mom about that Malcolm Gladwell book the other night, Outliers. Mm -hmm. And it is really interesting how, you know, um, there are these catalysts, you know, for change. And then there are these, there are these movements that happen that go viral, whether it's, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook or Bill Gates or, you know, even as far back as the Beatles, you know, it's just interesting. And now with this Occupy movement, how big that it's gotten, you know, is, is really interesting, you know, to me. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, I haven't read the, I haven't read the book. I'm familiar with it. Um, you know, I know his premise and, and so forth, but um, you have till the 18th of, of January when Deborah Freeze is going to join us. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. Um, but um, you know, achievement. You know, I really I think about that word a lot. Like, what what does it mean to achieve? And you know, this um, commodification of education. You know, and you know that really goes a lot. That goes against, you know, my, you know, my, my philosophy of why I learn. You know, there, there isn't a, a price tag behind it. Just because I learn something, I don't expect, you know, there to be a job at the end of it. And, you know, of course, I hope there will be, and I need a livelihood. But um, that's not, that's not what's driving the horse, so, so to speak. You know, and it's funny. I, I, I totally had forgotten about this, but I even, I had a dream, you know, I had a dream the other night about, you know, um, recognition, and I think there's a lot of people in the world that want to be recognized for the things that they do, and I think, you know, one reason the Occupy movement, you know, is moving in the way that it is, is there's a certain anonymity that's happening, and I think there is a, a great power in numbers, you know, and when we can, you know, kind of put our egos on the shelf and, you know, really start um, doing things for good, for good, you know, to quote Monica a little bit there, you know, we can make, you know, we can make, we can make big things happen with small steps, you know, um, together, and there needs to be a togetherness, I think, I think that's really important in all of this, and that's, you know, just my sense of walk out and walk on um, in these communities, in these seven different communities that I'm really interested to read about, there seems to be a certain togetherness that's taking place, and I think that's, you know, that's a really powerful thing. Well, I'm glad I gave you last word. Um, and if others want to leap in, um, you have to leap in on your own blog. And I want to say, um, Marianne, your blog post recently was quite wonderful. Um, so people should go there and check that out. Um, and other people as well. But um, we should sign off for this evening. Um, Next week's sort of a holiday. I'm going to be around. Uh, we'll have to kind of figure out who else might want to join us. Um, but uh, we meet here every Wednesday evening um, at the behest or the uh, support from Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo at worldbridges.net and edtechtalk.com. And um, we should sign off for this evening. Thank you all and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Oh, if somebody could maybe copy the chat that's happening on the Hangout and send it to me, that would be really useful because when I'm recording, I can't see that chat, and maybe I can bring some things together. So if that's possible, that would be great. Good night.
Good night. Thank you. Good night. Night. Thank you, Chad, for stopping. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.